It is a great pleasure to have you all here tonight. Uh, I also want to name a few couple of special guests we have because this is such an important issue. We have Nermina from Congresswoman DeGette's office. Um, and then we, have a, we had a couple other congressional offices that weren't able to make it tonight, but that we will uh, be doing some follow-up with, probably a conference call with John to talk about these issues with them. And then we also have someone from the Mexican consulate uh, coming shortly. He's, I don't believe he is here yet, but he will be arriving. Um, and they are here uh, because this is an issue that actually uh, the illegal arms trail trade is something that the Mexican current Mexican government is very concerned about. I want to introduce John Lindsay Poland. Um, uh, he, I'll give you the formal stuff and then I'll tell you some other pieces. But he coordinates the Stop U.S. Arms to Mexico, which is a project of global exchange. And he's the author of Plan Colombia, U.S. Ally Atrocities and Community Activism. And he also, the reason that I know John and, uh, is because he works uh, at the AFSC office in California's Healing Justice office, at California's Oakland, AFSC's Oakland office, and he works on healing justice there. And these issues are all intersectional. And we're super excited to have John here with us. He was up in Fort Collins, uh, gave a similar presentation there, and met with folks both in immigrant rights and in gun violence prevention there. And so this is a start of some dialogues that don't happen enough in this, in this state and in this country. And so we're excited to have group, folks from, from both groups and look at the, explore the intersectionalities. Um, I had the privilege of traveling with John, I guess it was in June of 2016, um, to Mexico on, it was an AFSC delegation looking at violence that is happening in Mexico and the role of the U.S. legal arms sales there and how that impl has implications for so many issues including immigration and the issue of forced migration due to violence that um, the U.S. sales of arms has a huge, huge uh, component of. And we met with human rights activists throughout in different parts of Mexico and we also met with the U.S. Embassy and shared what we saw at the end and our perspectives. Um, unfortunately, we did not, uh, we, yeah, there were obviously some concerns around, around that that we shared very vocally with them. Um, and John's <coughs> knowledge and in-depth work throughout, in Latin America, uh, gives him a really unique perspective to understand these issues and then his work in the U.S. Uh, both on healing justice, but also connecting with immigrant rights and the issues around gun violence, being that we have an amazing expert and incredible human being here. Um, and so please uh, help me in welcoming John Lindsay Poland this evening. Thank you uh, so much, Gabriela. Um, who, uh, it was great to travel with Gabriela and to be a co-worker in the American Defense Service Committee with her and Jordan and Piper and lots of other folks. Um, and thank you also to the, the different organizations that um, ha, are bringing us together today. Um, it's true that it is unusual that people who are working on peace and gun violence prevention and migrant justice come not only to work together, but like come together into the same room. So, um, uh, that's, we're really hoping to generate some conversation that will enable us to not only have a, more of a shared analysis about these issues, but also be able to work together in some ways coming, going forward. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been seeing a lot of people lately washing their hands. <laughs> Often. And why are they washing their hands? They're washing their hands because they want to prevent the transmission of a vector of disease. That's how you can do it, is if you wash your hands, you prevent that, that vector from coming to you. If we think about uh, guns and ammunition as potential, not always, but potential vectors of a disease, which is gun violence, 
then we, will, we might begin to think about them in a different way. We might begin to take a public health approach to what these things are. But unlike what we know so far about the coronavirus, guns and ammunition, especially guns, last a long time. They are long-term durable goods. They can last decades or even longer. So, um, and they move from place to place. And when they move from place to place, they are uh, equally potentially uh, vectors of violence. So um, a lot of times there is a discussion about gun violence and it's really focused on the United States. Or there's a discussion about violence in Mexico and it's a discussion about drugs or about cartels or about state violence, but not about the, the, those same vectors. Um, so um, I want to say that We'll be talking tonight, and I'll be presenting you a lot of information. Um, uh, and we're talking about things that are um, just the very knowledge of them can be toxic. Right? Just knowing how people harm each other using these things can be really hard. And in my experience, if, if I take in that knowledge of how people are using these weapons, or what people are doing to each other, and I don't do something with it, it can hurt me. If it just stays inside me and I don't do anything with it, then it can, it can be a toxin that lives inside and, and harms me. So whatever that thing is, it might be taking political action, it might be doing art, it might be writing to your congressperson, it might be doing, uh, write, for me it's writing, it's like, the best thing for me. But I just want to put that out there um, because uh, uh, we we're going to get into a, some difficult information, so, so hold on and we will work together on this. So, um, next slide, please. Um, one of the things I, I think it's important to think about uh, to begin with is when we talk about violence prevention and safety, who are we talking about? Because it's that calculus that is, in, is in really important, not only within, between the United States and Mexico and Central America, but within the United States. After uh, 20 first graders and, teacher, and several teachers were killed at Sandy Hook in 2012, there was appropriately a great deal of outrage and angst. But we don't always see the same kind of outrage and angst when young people in Chicago are murdered one at a time after another, right? So it's the same question that we might we need to ask in terms of who is harmed and who is at risk. Um, and I, th because the folks who are promoting what are called gun rights are also talking about a cost. They're positing a cost of gun violence prevention policies but we need to measure and think about who is being harmed and who is most at risk. So um, I want to go back in time a little bit because when we think about um, the use of violence in Mexico and in Latin America, we're not talking about something that began with the Trump administration. It did not begin with the arrival of the unaccompanied minors in, in 2014. It did not begin with the drug wars in 2007. It did not begin with the Central America wars in the 1980s. It did not begin with the coups in the 1950s. This is a long term, this begins with the Monroe Doctrine in the 1820s where the United States essentially says, this is our backyard, we have the right to control the destinies of these nations and we will use military force in order to do so. That means using arms. So this is just, oh, it's very hard to see. But um, it's a map of Latin America, and all of those uh, colored dots are um, interventions just in the period between 1789 and 1860. If you go forward on the next slide, um, we jump forward to what is known as the gunboat, gunboat diplomacy period uh, at the turn of the 20th century in the first 30 to 40 years of the, of the 20th century. And this is mapping US military interventions, specially concentrated in, uh, in the Caribbean, in Central America, uh, and in Mexico. 
important to remember that there was this war between 1846 and 1848 that resulted in Mexico ceding more than two-thirds of its territory, including most of Colorado. So uh, this is often not taught in U.S. schools, but it is an important piece of the history of the use of U.S. arms in Latin America. Um, so um, jumping forward in time, uh, in the mid-2000, um, the, uh, the Cold War is over, and uh, the, the um, violence between uh, drug organizations, criminal organizations in Mexico, begins to grow. And a new president seeking some legitimacy, in part because of evidence of electoral fraud, um, went to the military, the Mexican military, and said, uh, we want to declare a war. And he also went to Washington. He went to President George W. Bush and said, we want to declare a drug war. And this resulted in what is known as the Merida Initiative, um, signed in the city of Merida, therefore its name, which uh, revol resulted in several billion dollars in transfers of um, mostly military equipment, uh, some intelligence, some training, um, to Mexican military and police forces. Um, and it's now, uh, it's mostly through the State Department, but uh, a, lot of, a lot more now is going through the Pentagon. It's a lot less visible. Um, if you go to the next. So this is just a graph of military and police assistance and sales from the United States to Mexico beginning in 2000 going through 2017. And you see this huge leap which corresponds to when the Merida Initiative was implemented. Um, now, you also see it going down. The red here is arms sales, and the orange and the purple is assistance. And um, you'll notice that the, the red continues to go up. It goes up after this initial leap, which is mostly assistance. And afterwards, the amount of sales goes up. It's sort of like if I want to sell you something and I give you a sample, you're probably, and it's a, maybe a very sophisticated system, you're probably going to buy that thing the next time you, you're, you need one. So that's a lot of what happens with these military sales. U.S. assistance programs are a promotion mm -hmm. for U.S. overseas armed sales. So now, I mean, it's very important for any kind of pol thinking about the policies because we're not just talking about U.S. appropriations of tax dollars, U.S. taxpayer dollars. We're talking about assistance where, Me I'm sorry, sales, where Mexico is paying for the majority. There's still assistance programs, but Mexico is paying for the majority of transfers of military and police equipment. Um, uh, this is um, just to show that um, the Mexico is extreme. It, this is a, a, a graph of different Latin American nations and the sales of firearms and munitions um, uh, in 2018. So Mexico um, buys more firearms and munitions from the United States than practically all the rest of Latin America combined. So you might think about other large Latin American nations as being big customers, but Mexico is a, is a very critical um, customer. Uh, in addition, so this is a, a graph just showing um, uh, weapon sales to Mexico and to El Salvador um, between um, uh, 1993 and 2017. And something else I want you to notice here is that, um, I'm wondering if we can raise that just a little bit, Piper. Um, no, I can uh, move this. Is that uh, during the Obama years, during, during the Democratic administrations, sales are very high. This is not just a function of Republican administrations. Um, so uh, Mexico, again, it's, it, it goes way up and continues to stay up. Um, and I, uh, one thing I want to say about uh, El Salvador um, is you might think, okay, this was meant to result in greater security, right? You're exporting weaponry in order to, to security forces primarily, in order to increase the security of people living in those countries. Um, in fact, in, the, in El Salvador, in all of these countries, violence has gone up. In El Salvador, 
um, uh, there were um, uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders uh, has documented over 200 cases of Salvadorans deported from the United States since 2013 who experienced sexual violence, torture, went missing, or were harmed. Um, and uh, so it, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that as, as uh, something else. Um, you can go forward. Um, so in, in the case of uh, Honduras, um, which, by the way, I, just before we started this, I got an uh, email saying that the president of Honduras, uh, Juan Orlando Hernandez, uh, has been named by uh, prosecutors in New York um, as having uh, paid off a drug trafficker in 2013. Uh, and this is a, clearly a U.S. client. Uh, the current government of Honduras is, of course, there's a U.S. military base in Honduras, but um, it's also a client in many other ways, including cooperation on uh, returning migrants or receiving migrants. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this, um, uh, Juan Orlando Hernandez was uh, re-elected in uh, what many considered to be fraudulent elections in 2018. Uh, when there were protests in response, the military police fired on those protests. Um, the military police were armed with uh, cult rifles, which are produced in Connecticut. They probably were not supposed to get them, but uh, they, they received them anyway as, uh, as through armed sales, and I'll come back to how that works, if we can go to the next one. Uh, so, Colorado is not a significant exporter to Mexico or Central America of uh, weaponry. Uh, however, uh, I'm talking about legal exports. Um, however, just over in Wyoming, um, there are several companies um, that produce uh, either uh, ammunition or weapons accessories or rifles, um, and uh, we have data showing that from Wyoming there was more than $1.8 million in military rifles and bullets and munitions that went to, uh, that went to Honduras and another two and a half million that went to Mexico just in 2018. I just, um, I just can't help myself. Hmm? Magpul was pushed out of Colorado with our 2013 gun laws and they said they left and we were like, bye, great, anyways, so they just whether they were pushed out or whether they they, chose made, they made a business decision. Right. They made a business <laughs> right. decision. Uh, right. Yeah. Yes. That, no. And, and Weatherby, by the way, you can if you can read this, it says goodbye California, hello Wyoming, <laughs> <laughs> because Weatherby used to be based in Southern California, and as we know, California has stronger gun laws than most other um, states. Uh, that you know, it's, we'll come back to that because it actually points out the importance of federal action because sometimes uh, gun companies or gun traffickers take advantage of w the weak gun laws in one state uh, in order to do something in another state or outside the United States. We can go to the next one. So um, how does this affect migrants? Well, uh, uh, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala have among the highest gun homicide rates in the world. Um, and um, that has, how one of the impacts that has had is that Mexico is now a, a, a transit country for migrants. It is not just a source for migrants. And I think most people are aware of that. Um, because of conditions in the so-called Northern Triangle countries that are in many cases totally unsustainable. A family, in many cases, cannot live there and, and survive. So they leave. They go to the next one. Um, and once they leave, they become exposed to various kinds of dangers. Some of these are fairly new under the Trump administration. Some are not as new. But just to mention some of them, the so-called Remain in Mexico program or migrant protection pro protocols, what some people call the migrant persecution protocols, require that if someone gets to the border, and is able to get over the border and, and declare that they seek not to have asylum, then they will um, be required after they they have their initial interview to wait for their um, their appointments in Mexico. 
there are upwards of 60,000 migrants who have been turned back into northern Mexico cities after applying for asylum in southern United States. Um, these are extremely dangerous places to um, be. Um, there is also what are known as the safe third country agreements. These are relatively new, where Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, and Mexico are, have assigned agreements with the Trump administration to say, okay, we will receive people who have, a, who have applied, who are seeking asylum in the United States, because, or the United States says, we will not accept you into a country, uh, into the United States, uh, if you have gone through a country where you could have applied for asylum and it is, quote, safe. So even though Honduras, El Salvador, uh, and Guatemala, and Mexico are extremely unsafe, they're being declared safe countries for the nationals of other nations to be returned to. And, and they're uh, supposedly applied for asylum. In addition, at the, the border checkpoints, the Border Patrol is only accepting small numbers of people to um, cross over and, and seek to a, a, an initial interview for asylum. So in many cases, five or 10 a day, or, or even like 10 a week. Which means that there are thousands of people who are waiting on the Mexican side just to cross over in order to have their initial interview. Um, and then, of course, there are all the ways in which the Trump administration is seeking to exclude certain um, categories of people who, have, who are facing violence, gang violence and domestic violence being among the most prominent, um, as bases for granting asylum. So one of the things that happens is that um, Central Americans who are coming into Mexico, who are being detained by Mexico and deported by Mexico, Ha, um, you, may, you may have heard of the Bestia, right? The train on which many migrants have traveled. But there are routes like that where migrants are much more likely to expose to state agents who are armed, who will detain them and deport them. So instead they take other routes, in the backs of trucks or, or other actual physical routes, um, where those routes are much more likely to be controlled by organized crime. And organized crime in Mexico is mostly armed through illegal traffic from the United States. Illegal traffic of weapons from the United States. From the United States. This took a new turn in the past year when um, the new president of Mexico, uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, um, uh, proposed the creation of a National Guard and um, the rationale for creating the National Guard was to fight organized crime, which is, of course, a very serious issue within Mexico. But the first task of the National Guard, when it was deployed in the spring of this past year, was to, this is during the caravans, was to detain and deport migrants. Um, and this is just an image, not of a National Guard agent, but of a, an immigration agent in Chiapas. Let me keep going. Um, so, this is just another illustration of how Mexico itself is not safe. It is not a safe place for migrants to stay. Uh, this is a, a graph since the year 2000 through 2019 of uh, gun homicides and other kinds of homicides in Mexico. And you can see the homicide rate is at its all time high since it's begun, since documentation began. The red on each of these bars represents gun homicides and the, the, the orange gold represents by other means. Now, any homicide is brutal, but it's important to note that the percentage of homicides committed with firearms has grown uh, dramatically since the 2000s period. And in fact, homicides were, were on a steady and even declining pace until 2005, 2006. One of the things that happened in 2005 and 2006 was the end of the assault weapons ban in the United States, which expired in 2004, in the fall of 2004. And there are studies that show an increase in the number of gun homicides in northern Mexican communities in the wake of the ex expiration of the assault weapons ban. And um, independent of the conflict between cartel organizations and the state. Um, 
So it's just another illustration of how what role guns play. Keep going. So um, again, uh, these uh, migrants are being exported, uh, deported into, or may be made to wait in places that are flooded with U.S. guns. And I'll show you a map of this. But these are these are ten cities that have grown up uh, on these uh, northern Mexico cities. If we keep going. If, if people get to the U.S. border, if they get onto the other side of the U.S. border, of course, they are faced with other armed people, which include the border patrol agents. Um, and those folks are also arming up. So they're buying tens of millions of dollars of firearms and millions of bullets. Uh, this is picture was taken on Friday because some of you know that the Ninth Circuit Court well, uh, said that the migrant protection program was uh, elite protocols were illegal, and then uh, this was CBP's SWAT team uh, on the bridge in in Juarez, in El uh, Paso, uh, facing Ciudad Juarez, just observing, just observing. That's what they said. No enforcement, just observing. Um, now that court decision was there was a stay put on it later in the day. So all these people who came to the bridges with copies of the decision in hand were turned back and their, their initial hopes were matched. What's CPB? Is uh, Customs and Border Patrol. Um, so this is um, just a, a graph and a map of the people who were being so-called metered. So like they're not even in the migrant protection protocols yet. They're waiting to get an interview. And they're waiting in these northern Mexico cities. Um, and the numbers are actually going down because they, they're, the odds of them getting, ever getting asylum are so low, and because the cities where they are waiting are extremely dangerous. And they are being uh, preyed upon by criminal organizations. Because if you think about it, a, a migrant who gets as far as the U.S. border probably has a, a family member in the United States. If they have a family member in the United States, they probably have a phone number. And the, those border cities in Mexico are controlled by criminal organizations. So if you're in a shelter that has no security around it, and there's many thousands of people in those shelters, then you're going to be a target for, for a cartel or criminal organization that's going to get your phone number and get you to call pay tens of thousands of dollars or however many thousands of dollars in ransom. So for the criminal organization's business model, this has been fantastic. Because they are now have material for an enormous amount of extortion. And people, you know, one of the important things is that we talk about firearms in homicides, or maybe we talk about them in their, their role in forced disappearances. But the role of firearms in extortion is super important in Mexico. It is, it is what is forcing many people to leave because they know if they don't pay the extortion, they, they're likely to be killed. So if you're a migrant and you happen not to have a family member in the United States and the cartels kidnap you, God help you. <clears throat> um, so one of the things that this also shows is that the darker part of each um, bar is the number of Mexicans who are waiting to cross over. So in the last few months, the number of Mexicans who are leaving places like Michoacan and Guerrero, where there is also very, very heavy gun violence, uh, has grown enormously. So as the chances for Central Americans and Haitians and others um, to, act, to get anywhere at the U.S. border has, has uh, closed, many Mexicans are, are coming because their situations are also unsustainable. So now, I'm going to look a little bit at legal exports. So um, this is uh, just a graph showing the number of firearms, parts, and ammunition exports from the United States to Mexico since 2002. And um, so a lot of it is not just guns. A lot of it is munitions, and a lot of it is parts. Um, so those parts are then being assembled uh, within Mexico, if we can go to the next one. Um, and uh, one of the, th so I should, I should back up a little bit and say, if a company, suppose you are a gun producer in the United States, if you want to export to Mexico or any other country, you need to obtain a license 
from the State Department. This is about to change to the Commerce Department. We can talk more about that. But um, in that license, that is supposed to name the end users. Who are going to actually end up with these firearms or these weapons? Um, and then the, the license is granted, and it's, it's for a certain amount of time, and for a certain amount of money, and for a certain kinds of, of weaponry. Uh, and then the company uh, is able to export those weapons. Uh, Six Sauer, which is a company in New Hampshire, originally from Germany, but has a large US production uh, capacity, um, got a license in 2015 for up to $265 million worth of firearm exports to the Mexican Navy. The Mexican Navy, so this is maybe like, if they're pistols, which is what they produce a lot of, this is maybe like 400,000 pistols. It's a lot of weapons. The Mexican Navy only has 40,000 troops. <laughs> so you're kind of like, what is this all for? Um, now that is up to a certain amount. Um, we do know, if you can go to the next one, that the Mexican Navy Special Forces um, did receive uh, submachine guns, and we know that in part because they showed on the internet them practicing at Camp Pendleton in California with those uh, submachine guns. Um, now, um, if we can go to the next one, we, in 2018, uh, Mexican uh, Navy Special Forces were implicated in several dozen forced disappearances in the, in the Mexican town of Nuevo Laredo. And if you can uh, click on the, there's a, this is a, a video here, so in the lower left, you'll see this is a security camera showing uh, Mexican Naval Special Forces coming into the house of Jessica Molina and Daniel Trejo. They were in Nuevo Laredo, um, they also they lived, were living most of the time in Laredo, Texas. And um, uh, they came in and they pointed their guns and said, we're, we're looking for someone, and they named an alias who was not any of the people there. And they took Daniel and they took another man who was staying there as he was about to pass over to the other side. They took migrate. And um, Jessica has a U.S. passport. And so they were looking through her stuff, and they saw the U.S. passport, and they said, okay, don't touch her. Um, that was in March of 2018, and there has been not a single word of where Danielle is, or the other man who was there, where they were, or the other people who were forcibly disappeared. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is Jessica, who um, was speaking in Nogales, uh, Arizona, uh, about a year ago, who has been very vocal. The Mexican Navy is often named by U.S. government officials as a more trustworthy partner, let's say, <coughs> than others in Mexico. Um, but in fact, when you look at the records of torture um, used by different military or police forces, the Navy comes out the worst uh, compared to any other. Um, and in this case, they were implicated in several dozen forced disappearances. The United Nations Human Rights Council denounced this, and yet there's been zero uh, advance in the judicial investigation of these crimes. Um, and Jessica is just a very, to me, a very um, courageous and inspiring woman um, who keeps talking about it. Now, those are weapons that go to the, went to the military. All weapons that are imported into Mexico, if they're not going to be used by the Mexican Navy or the Mexican Army, are received, are imported by the Mexican Army. The Mex they're the only ones legally authorized to import weapons. They're also the only ones legally authorized to sell weapons within the country. So the Mexican Army sells weapons to police throughout the country or to any individuals who obtain a license, and that's not a very large number, or to private security companies. Um, there's one gun store in all of Mexico, in Mexico City, that's run by the Army. Um, so it's not, they're not easily obtained legally. So most of the clients for those legal exports uh, that are going through the Mexican Army are police. Um, and uh, this is just showing the number of weapons that they uh, sold legally to different parties within Mexico, about 40,000 a year of firearms. This is in a country of 120 million, 130 million. Um, so if you can go to the next one. Now, who are the end users in the police? 
we got documentation that from the Mexican Army that six hour weapons went to state police in 19 different states, including in states where it is widely recognized that police are colluding with organized crime and or have committed human, serious human rights abuses without prosecution. Um, so this includes Tamaulipas, it includes Michoacan, uh, it includes a number of other states, including Chihuahua, um, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, next one. Um, this is, uh, it was taken a few weeks ago in Nuevo Laredo, and um, the people I'm standing next to are family members um, who in September of last year, um, their, their family members were killed by Tamaulipas State Police in an operation where the state police claimed that there was a firefight with an organized criminal group. Uh, next to me is Cassandra Trevino, and her experience was that they came in, these troops came in very early in the morning, and they said, where are the guns? Where are the guns? And they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. Um, her father, who she had just seen in shorts and sandals, was taken into the other room, and she heard them telling him to get dressed. And she had her baby in her, uh, in her arms. She looks really young, but she is 18. Um, she had her baby in her arms, and the police were, were hitting her and trying to get her to let go of her baby. And she has said that she thinks that because she didn't let go of her baby, that's why she lived. So then they said, get out of here, keep walking, don't look back or we'll shoot you. And um, the next thing that she knew, um, there were several people who were killed in that house, including her father. Before she left, the last sight she had of her father, he had been dressed in military fatigues and boots. And then she understood what they were saying when they said, get dressed. Because then they took the bodies and they hired a, a, a truck to take it to another location in order to say that there was a firefight in this other location. The truck driver ended up testifying that he was told to do this by the police and subsequently was threatened, as, as uh, Cassandra has also been threatened. So these are state police that have, according to Mexican Army records, have received more than 500 six-hour firearms since 2014. Let me go to the next one. Now, this is uh, Maria Herrera, who is uh, also a very courageous woman, has had four sons uh, forcibly disappear in Michoacan. Very, very um, a woman from the heart, and she has been looking all over the country for the remains of disappeared persons with hundreds of other people. Um, and this was a trip that we took to Six Hour in New Hampshire, where we actually did try to get an appointment with uh, Six Hour company officials, and they said, we're not meeting with you tomorrow, Forever. Um, so it was okay. Um, now, there are other companies, if you can keep going to the next one. Um, this is, uh, these are grenade launchers that are produced by a company called Milcor USA in Tucson that have been exported to Mexican Army Special Forces that have been also involved in uh, human rights abuses. Keep going. Um, Cult Industries is based in Connecticut and um, exports more uh, firearms legally to Mexico than any other company in the United States. Um, they are also the firearm that is encountered, that is recovered illegally, illegal firearms that are trafficked to Mexico more common than any other make of weapon. In this particular case, so one of the important things to know is that most homicides in Mexico are not even formally investigated. Right? So the level of impunity is very, very high. And this has been recognized by the new government um, what that means is that there's no judicial record, and there is no record of what firearm was used. But there are some cases that have been investigated extensively, um, one of which was the forced disappearance of 43 student teachers in Ayotzinapa, Guerrero, in 2014, which became an international case. It was shocked to very many people. In that case, uh, local and state police attacked students who were um, trying to get buses for a protest, um, they were forcibly disappeared. There were six people, including several students, who were killed at the time, but then the 43 students never showed up again. And those police were armed with um, K uh, Colt uh, rifles, a uh, variant of the AR-15, um, that were exported to Mexico from the United States. Um, there's also a, a firearm. Uh, it's, it's, it's a 
uh, a form of a Gatling gun, which fires uh, up to 3,000 rounds a minute. So if you've ever heard, I don't know if you've ever heard a recording of the gun in Las Vegas, it's like a right? This is more like thunder, just constant thunder. And they're usually mounted on helicopters. They're really war, war weapons, right? Um, now, these are produced in Arizona, in Scottsdale, Arizona, and um, the, uh, the, uh, the um, federal police and the uh, Navy has, have several. And in the case in 2014, um, the uh, federal police fired on a compound that was uh, run, probably run by a criminal organization, but extraditionally killed 22 people, including five from the air. So it's a Black Hawk helicopter, which is another U.S. weapon but using this Gatling gun to fire on people below. So, um, <clears throat> now let's turn to the illegal traffic. Right? That was all about the legal flow of weapons. The illegal flow of weapons is at least as important. And one thing I want to say here um, is that many of the same things that the movement for gun violence prevention in this country is calling for would be extremely important in Mexico. So, uh, just to give you a sense of how important U.S. guns are in Mexico. About 70% of all guns recovered at crime scenes in Mexico are U.S. sourced. Uh, if that figure applies to all gun homicides in Mexico, then there were more gun homicides with U.S. sourced guns in Mexico last year than there were gun homicides in all of the United States. And it's about a third of the population, a little bit more than a third of the population. So um, it, what, when we think about what the impact of, of gun measures here are, it's very important to think about what, where, how they impact in, in uh, Mexico. So um, it's, it is illegal to cross weapons over the border, but it is very easy to do so. Um, uh, if you go to a gun shop in uh, Phoenix or in, Air, in uh, Houston or potentially in Denver, and you buy an assault weapon, it's very easy to get it over the border. Because the infrastructure at the border, you might think, aren't they building a wall there? Like, is, aren't they like trying to stop all this illegal stuff happening at the border? But it's all about the south to north movement. Right, this is the infrastructure of racism. Because of course, only bad things could be coming from Mexico. There's no bad things that could be coming from this country going into Mexico. So therefore, we don't have to have infrastructure to actually stop things going from north to south. So you can walk over the bridge with whatever, you know, something in your handbag. Maybe you take an AR-15, you take it out, and you take the lower, you take the different parts, and you put it into your bag. You're not going to be stopped. Highly, highly unlikely that you will be stopped. So what happens is what's called the ant trade, um, where people take things over in a little bit at a time. You can go to the next slide. Um, another important piece of this is that both countries have prioritized legal trade. So there is an enormous flow of legal trade going over that border. Uh, you know, 180,000 uh, vehicles every single day from north to south. It's going to be very difficult to stop things at the border. So any kind of strategy, in my view, has to go upstream. Because otherwise, it's like just like drugs so that are coming from south to north. It hasn't been super successful, has it? Because the priority is legal commerce. And you, if you stop every single truck and car, you're going to put a real serious problem into that legal commerce. I'll go to the next one. So um, this is just showing the percentage of, of guns trafficked. Uh, that are coming from the United States. Uh, these might be U uh, European or, or produced in Europe or in other countries, but they're sold in the United States, right? So a, a distributor or a gun uh, dealer in the United States imports weapons from another country and then they sell them at a retail level here. Um, in uh, Central America, the percentages are not quite as high. In, in El Salvador, it's about 50%. In Guatemala and Honduras, it, it um, hovers around 30%. So, um, every, every year, guns are recovered at crime scenes in Mexico. Okay. And those guns are sent to the ATF for tracing. Or the information about them is sent for tracing. Of those, and, and all, these days, just about all guns that are recovered, the information is sent for tracing. 
of all of those, 70% are sourced to some kind of legal sale in the United States. Okay, thanks. Um, to a legal sale? Well, typically a legal sale. I mean, it's usually from a firearms dealer. It could be at a gun show. Um, you know, if, if it's for, that includes U.S. manufactured weapons that might have been illegally sold. Um, now, if we can go to the next one. Where are they coming from? Texas is the source of 42% of the illegally trafficked firearms into Mexico. I mean, Texas is just a, it's an incredible gun market. Um, uh, and I would note that Colorado is among the top 10 states for sources of guns trafficked from the U.S. into Mexico. Um, Arizona is also very important, as is California, um, uh, partly just because they're big and they have their right adjacent to, to uh, Mexico. John, did you say these are the legal or the illegal? These are the Ill illegally trafficked weapons. Okay, now, uh, can you go to the next slide? Um, we have gotten data on where guns have been recovered in Mexico since 2010 for every gun. For about approximately 123,000 guns, we have data on those guns that were where they were recovered, when they were recovered, and so we map this. And um, it's on our website. Uh, it's kind of in the shade over there. And so, I, but I do encourage you to, to go to our website and check it out because it's interactive, and um, you can see guns are going all over Mexico. Um, we go to the next one. If you zoom in on this map um, to the Rio Grande Valley, so this is in the eastern, south, southeastern border of uh, Texas in Tamaulipas. Um, on, the, on the Tamaulipas side, this is the number of firearms recovered between 2010 and 2018. 35, over 3,500 in one town in, in Tamaulipas in Mexico, including 622 assault weapons. Um, you can go to the next one. So we also have on this map the number of licensed gun dealers on the U.S. side. So just on the other, like just over the river, like from here to the end of this building, uh, is Laredo, which has 47 licensed gun dealers. Uh, and you can see in the in the when you look at this map that there are an enormous number of firearms dealers on the just on the U.S. side, which I'll come back to in just a moment. Go to the next one. So um, this is one reason why assault weapons are so important to address, because criminal organizations want to control territory. If you control territory, then you control the economic activity in that territory. And these organizations want to make money. That's what they want to make. So they make money through selling drugs, but they also make money through human trafficking, they make money through extortion, they make money through um, siphoning off oil, they make money a lot of different ways, but they do that because they control territory. That means that they've bought off the politicians and the police in that area, but it means they, they, they it, it's, it's a territorial thing. And if you want to control territory, then you want military assets, which includes military-grade weaponry and trained men. So assault weapons, which in this country are responsible for some of the most shocking mass shootings and crimes, when you look at overall gun violence, are not responsible for that many gun homicides in this country. And that is sometimes an argument used even by Democrats to say this is not the highest priority, right? There are other types of measures um, to control gun violence in this country that people are taking because they're focused on gun violence in this country. But if you look at the role of assault weapons in Mexico, it has a much more outsized role. So um, of the, um, uh, in this database that we got, <coughs> of more than 53,000 weapons recovered since 2010, where both the make and the caliber were identified, more than 12,000 were assault weapons, um, which is you know, more than 22%. That is a very different uh, picture that you find in crime guns in the United States, which are mostly in the United States. Um, so if we go to the next one. <coughs> so I took a trip to Texas a few weeks ago, and we started our trip uh, near uh, San Antonio, um, where in Kerrville, where there was a there was a gun show, and uh, because uh, unlike Colorado, um, Texas does not have a um, a requirement for universal background checks. That means that if you go to a gun show, oh, thank you. Um, if you go to a gun show, um, 
and you're not you're, you're buying something with, from someone who is not a licensed dealer, you don't need to undergo a background check. So if you've committed a felony, or if you're a domestic abuser, or if for some other reason you are prohibited by law from buying a weapon, it won't show up because you're buying from someone who is not required to own that check by state law. There's no federal law requiring it, and in many states there is no state law requiring it. Um, and so in this case, uh, I walked around, it was just a room with a lot of old guys, old white guys mostly, and um, there was this one, one fellow who was selling this, um, this weapon right here is a 50, ca 50 caliber uh, Barrett rifle. Um, it's, a, it's a sniper rifle that can shoot more than a thousand yards away, practically a mile away. Um, and they have been used by cartels, some are purchased by uh, Mexican military forces, but they're also used by cartels, including um, in one very significant case in October, where the Mexican government attempted to arrest the son of a Chapo Guzman in the city of Culiacan. And um, once word went out about his arrest, the cartels mobilized, and they took over the town and shot up. There were more than 20 people killed. They mobilized one of these bear rifles, and uh, they had to let go of, of uh, the Guzman fellow, uh, because otherwise the, the mayhem would have continued in that city. You can go to the next one. So this was at a, a gun shop in the town of Edinburgh. Um, the town of Edinburgh has 75,000 people and 20 gun dealers, licensed gun dealers. It's uh, just 15, 15 miles from the border. And the guys there, um, in, in the far corner there is another uh, 50 caliber rifle. Um, and these two weapons here, one of them is an assault rifle and one of them is a pistol. You can't tell which is which. But the gun industry is uh, innovating, let's say. So this one that's closer has a, is actually a pistol, but it has a brace on it. So it acts, it, it's, it has the same kind of qualities as an assault rifle, um, but because of its design, um, it's, it's not considered an assault rifle. So um, it's one of those things where you just have to, it, it, whenever we do implement any of these laws, we have to um, keep following uh, the industry. Um, if you go to the next one. So this was another place, uh, just in Mission, that was only three miles from the border, and um, the, this uh, assault rifle here, this rifle here, um, has a, 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 an ammunition drum that has a capacity for 60 rounds. It's like, well, what legal use would you have for uh, an ammo drum that has 60 rounds in it? Um, just three miles to the border, just two blocks from the high school. Um, this is Texas 40. You can go to the next one. Now, also, less than half a mile from the border, in Eagle Pass, Texas, is Maverick Arms, which exports um, hundreds of thousands of, uh, well, produces hundreds of thousands of firearms every year and has exported them. Uh, we don't have a record of them exporting to Mexico, but they are right there at the border. Um, we tried to talk with them, but they didn't have any way actually of calling. If, if, you, if you call a phone number, there's no person who answers. And uh, there's no person at the front gate. So there was no actual person to talk to. Um, we can go to the next one. So um, in addition to firearms themselves, the accessories and the ammo are very important. And um, we also got data from Mexico about the number of magazines, so ammunition magazines, which are, they're not as durable as firearms, but um, they, they, there were over 112,000 that were recovered that uh, were high capacity ammunition magazines. So the, um, uh, I believe Colorado has a ban on high capacity magazines, which is a, an important measure because if you have one of these weapons and you don't have a magazine that can allow you to fire a lot of shots, then you're not, it's not gonna be as destructive which is a good thing. Um, I would say that um, there's a bill in Congress to, uh, to ban high-capacity magazines at the federal level, and uh, it was voted out of the Judiciary Committee a few months ago, and the House leadership has not acted to bring it to the floor. Um, I think it's probable with a Democratic majority that it would get, it would get through the House. It probably
I would not get through the Senate. But if we're positioning the Democratic Party on this issue, it would be an important one, including um, discussing how it impacts Mexico. I can go to the next one. Um, now, there are a lot of firearms that are sold at you know mega stores, at like Walmart, and um, this is Academy Sports, uh, Sports in Barbelo. And they sell a lot of ammo as well as firearms. So this, for example, on the right is just a box of 420 rounds of uh, assault rifle ammo. Um, American-made military grade, right? So they're, they're bragging about the, the military grade aspect of this. And a lot of times you might have an argument with someone who's whose program says, no, the military has their own thing, this is not military. But the industry itself is, is boosting it as, as, as military. So that's in Ladero. If we go to the next slide, just on the other side of the border, there are um, thousands of people who are either in, in the MPP, in the Remain in Mexico program, or they are waiting in the meet to, to be metered and to apply. And um, they are exposed to all of this violence that is occurring. Um, uh, uh, Doctors of the Borders in, in Nuevo Laredo in October, two, just in the last October, um, eight out of ten people treated by them reported being victim of violence in the previous nine months. Forty-three percent of the patients said they had been, been, been victims of violence in the previous seven days. Um, of those who returned to Nuevo Laredo in September 2019, 18 out of 41 patients said they had been kidnapped recently. So this is the migrant policy of the Trump administration. It is putting people back into these situations where U.S. guns are creating an enormous human risk and uh, danger for them. If we can go to the next one. So um, uh, this occurred on Saturday, uh, just up the road in Loveland. Um, this was a gun rights rally. And um, I think it's really important for us to think about the narrative or the frame in which we're talking about mo both migration and guns. As you know, um, there are a number of sheriffs in this state who have declared sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Right? They've declared sanctuary. Isn't that a good thing? No. no. It's sanctuary for guns, for, including in the hands of people who have been declared extreme risks by courts. Um, and so how we understand this language about sanctuary, uh, it comes back to what I was saying earlier about what are, who's at risk and what are those risks? Because if we're talking about our rights and we're talking about the right to live um, and who is at risk, I think that's, uh, we just need to interrogate that stuff constantly and think about what sanctuary means in these cases. And of course sanctuary often has, it has, a, has a, a meaning related to the law, but it also has a religious meaning. And, you know, I, th I think it's good for us to, to, to have, enter the conversation about what is the sacred thing that we are protecting. With. So, um, go to the next one. Um, a little bit about um, things that we can do. Um, and I think it's so important that, you know, a lot of times in the gun violence prevention movement, people say, there are 90 gun deaths every day. End of sentence. In the United States, right? So often the frame is just in the United States and the impact of U.S. guns outside of these borders is not even part of the awareness or part of, and it, it gets communicated in those kinds of narratives. So um, I think it's, uh, you know, part of this is this narrative, that, that this idea that Mexicans and Central Americans and other migrants are threats to security. Like, what is that threat to security? Um, and that's and that this is just a security issue. That it's not a humanitarian issue. That it's a security issue. Um, and I just think we need to challenge that at every turn. Um, I also encourage people who are working on gun violence prevention to include the impact of U.S. guns on people outside the United States in their materials. Um, it is. Super important to uh, support the federal data and assault weapons and high capacity magazines. And I would note that um, Senator Feinstein's bill uh, for an assault weapons ban uh, has not been co sponsored by Senator Bennett, um, unlike the majority of Democrats. Um, now, there's something that's maybe a little more concrete and attainable, which is um, you might think at this point, oh my God, John, wow. 
hope, please. <laughs> um, the Mexican government, uh, which, so the new Mexican government took office in December of 2018. And in May of last year, you remember, President Trump threatened tariffs on Mexico if Mexico did not detain migrants and stop them from coming towards the U.S. border. And the Mexican government totally caved. They just threw the migrants under the bus. But um, after that, not long after that, uh, uh, the Mexican government began to bring another issue to the, to the bilateral table with the United States, which is gun trafficking. Like Gabriela mentioned this at the beginning. Um, and uh, so they're very interested in working with people in the United States to stop gun trafficking from this country into their country. And so I had some meetings with um, members of the foreign ministry uh, who are involved in this. And one of the things they talked about is that there are more than 50 Mexican consulates in the United States. And they're connected with Mexican communities all around the country. And they're interested in those consulates uh, and I don't know if this person from the consulate is here yet, but um, uh, engaging uh, the Mexican community on this issue, hearing from Mexicans here, as well as educating Mexicans here. Um, and I think that's a very crucial, that could be a very crucial step, um, both for Mexico, but also for the gun violence prevention community, which has been primarily white, um, and is aware of that, I think most, most people are very aware of it, um, and it would make it a stronger movement. It would make it a much stronger movement. So uh, there's a consulate here in Denver, and uh, I'm hoping that there maybe there could be, this was a suggestion from foreign ministry officials to have events um, that address this issue um, and, and bring it more into public awareness. Um, there is also uh, a conference uh, next month in Washington that will focus on gun violence in Mexico and Central America that will um, uh, both the problems and the solutions, um, and we'll have, we'll have a lot of different folks who have been working on these issues for a while, and then if you can go to the next one. Um, and then later this month, I invite you to Tucson, Arizona, where we are really attempting to build capacity. We want to build capacity in our movements, in our organizations, in our communities, to be able to organize on these issues, make these connections, but also to organize. So um, we will be doing actions, um, which will include bringing water out into the desert for migrants who are coming through the desert. It will include a protest in front of Mailcore USA, which exports grenade launchers. But then it will include a full day of workshops um, that are to build skills on legislative advocacy, on media, on working with families who are impacted by violence, on uh, doing research, um, so that we come away with a, a str both stronger relationships with each other um, from different parts of the U.S. and Mexico, but also um, with more skills to carry out the work that we need to do. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to go to the next one. Let's uh, just um, try to get in touch with me and some other sources of information, and maybe we can have some conversation. Um, I would love it to hear what people think about how to work together on these issues um, here in Denver. in Mexico, right? Yeah, because I'm presuming that, that the federal police is under or is is the Mexican government or is it under the Mexican government? So, is it overseen because it's federal? So Yeah. So, you know, sometimes people sure refer to the difference between a government and a state. Right? The state is the, is the permanent thing in place yes. and the government is the elected body. Right. Um, what I was basically referring to the AMLO government, the current elected government of the United States, 
which includes all the federal institutions in the country, right? all the executive federal institutions from the executive branch. Um, so that does include the Army. It does include the federal police. Now, the federal police are slated to be eliminated and replaced by the National Guard. But the National Guard is actually, when you look at the 80% of the troops in the National Guard are actually assigned to the Army or the Navy. Right? They're being paid by the Army and the Navy. The land that they're using is actually owned by the Army. So um, the National Guard is much more uh, a, a, an appendage to the military, even though it's supposed to be a civilian body. I mean, that's a whole longer conversation about the militarization of law enforcement in, in Mexico, where how, how do you, when you have a criminal activity or criminal organization, do you fight it as a war, or do you fight it as a, as a violation of law? And it's a very important distinction because it has an implication that, I mean, I didn't really mention it much, but the drug war, and the, the start of the drug war, you can, you can trace to that all of this militarization, a lot of movement of weapons um, into Mexico. Um, the relationship between the federal government and the state police, uh, the state police are functions of state governments. And uh, so they are, you know, they're governors and, and legislatures in each of those state governments. Um, but they, they get their weapons from the, military, from the army and from the national through the, both the military, which actually sells the weapons, and then they are overseen by a federal security agency, which is what is doing it. The Citizen Security Secretary, um, which uh, is, is, is supposed to oversee security in the country as a whole. Understanding, and I don't know if Gabriela knows more, is that um, they so it was the the ruling was issued Friday morning, and then sometime in the evening or afternoon, evening on Friday, they issued the stay. Uh, lots of confusion, lots of chaos. Uh, I read, but I can't confirm that the stay was issued because they knew it was going to go to the Supreme Court. And but I don't I don't even know what the logic is for why you would put a stay on if you knew it was going to. Supreme Court. It's there's a lot of confusion, in this so I, I wish I had. I wish there were more clarity. But what it does mean is that people are because of the stay. Um, I, I mean, there's a, a very also very weird language. Like um, the Border Patrol said, uh, or I know I'm sorry, it was DHS issued a statement saying we are not processing people in the migrant protection protocols right now, which seems to indicate that they're not accepting people in. But the end of the MPP should have meant that they were that they would accept people in who had already filed their paperwork. Right. So it's a it's very confusing right now. I, wish, I don't know if you have any more. I think um, just to add, like a, as soon as the ruling happened, our government sent um, very heavily armed border patrol, like what John showed in his picture but hundreds of them to all the ports of entry and a really strong show of force to say, don't try to approach now. Um, uh, we saw pictures from our San Diego program over the weekend of, of that show of force and um, they did some exercises as well in San Diego and, and El Paso. Um, so right now, everything is the same. That, that ruling because of this day hasn't changed anything for people that John showed waiting in danger on the southern side of the border or folks who are currently um, in the process of their interview. I'm interested in your thoughts on the political situation in Mexico when AMLO was elected. He was quite popular. There was hope, a lot of support. Is he losing some of that support because of his inability to deal with any of this? Um, so the question is about uh, Amlo, who is, had a very, very high level of su support when he was elected. Is he losing any of that support? 
Um, some polls indicate that yes, uh, there's still a majority of people who, who kind of exactly how the question is framed, whether he's doing a good job or whether they support him. I think it went down from 79% to 59% in the most recent poll. Um, you know, I think for a lot of Mexicans, at least that I talk with, um, there's this feeling of like, this was our best chance um, for change. And so, and there are forces who are stacked up against him. So let's not go against him. Uh, you know, give him the benefit of the doubt, his government the benefit of the doubt. And I think there are other people who are, who are much more skeptical. And, um, and, and uh, certainly anyone who has been working with migrants, is, it's been a severe disappointment. Because initially, you know, when the caravans first came, people were being issued humanitarian visas. But that ended pretty quickly. Um, uh, as somebody I know said, uh, we're just doing what the United States said is not a policy. <laughs> <laughs> Comments, thoughts? Are migrants still um, eligible to get uh, work visas in Mexico? Is that happening? Um, well, there's also there's a difference between eligibility and what's also happening. Um, I don't know. Does somebody else can answer that question? I mean, as far as what I've seen, heard is that they're not getting it, um, and there are also a lot of people who are like who are waiting in those moving schools are not getting any assistance at all. Right? So. And, and can't work, most of them can't work. But I don't know if anybody knows the kind of status of the actual eligibility. All right, so another question. Last I heard, the UN was not moving into or, or doing anything about these migrant camps, which have been described as the worst refugee camps on the planet at least in, in, the, in this hemisphere, um, because the, they had to be, they felt they had to be asked by the Mexican government to to come in and and, do, and help deal with it. Is, is that true? What about the UN? I think so. Yeah. You had said that Colorado was one of the top ten. Uh, that the, the only Guns going to, can you talk more about that? I mean, do we know where those guns are coming from here? Um, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, <clears throat> since the year 2000, the gun industry has succeeded in attaching legislation to appropriations I mean, at the federal level <coughs> that prohibits the ATF, the Outlaw Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, from disclosing any trace data. Like so, the ATF is responsible for for tracing weapons, whether they're within their, whether they're within the within the United States or if they're recovered in Mexico or another country. The information is sent to the ATF. They trace it. They can share that information with law enforcement agencies in the jurisdiction where the guns were found, but they cannot share it with anyone else. It's called the TIART Amendment. And I think that we should be overturning the TIART Amendment. Um, it hasn't been high on the priorities of the Democratic Party, to be honest. Um, but uh, because we can't even analyze what exactly, well, just what you asked. Because if we knew better who are the dealers, they're spe special <coughs> what are the patterns? Are the individuals buying them like over a long period of time? Are there, how many individuals are there? Is it concentrated in a, in a small number of networks or organizations? Um, how is it, how are the kinds of weapons that they're purchasing changing according to the location? How are the fi uh, firearms laws, which are so different between Texas and California, how are they impacted in this traffic? We can't analyze any of that. Um, Mexico is getting the data, um, but uh, it really requires a strategy within the United States as well. And a lot of law enforcement, you know, they're really focused on getting a prosecution. So they're looking for the outliers. But like a, a law enforcement agency like ATF or the DEA or the FBI, they're looking for a case they can win. So somebody who makes a lot of mistakes or who buys tons of assault weapons in one place, they might be a good target for prosecution. 
but that means that you don't see the overall patterns. And this is what I'm saying about going upstream. It's a market. We have to understand how this market works in order to address the destruction that its lack of regulation is creating. And uh, we can't do that without the trace information. So overturning the TR amendment should be uh, on the agenda, I think, of any new democratic administration. When was that amendment? T R T I A H R T. When? Oh, when it started in 2000, but it's annual. It's attached as a rider to uh, appropriations bills. The, the one graph you showed of the U.S. Uh, providing aid, and then in the red it was the sale of arms. So, which department or what exactly? Who's making that sale? So most of those sales are from private companies. So uh, a gun producer who wants to sell weapons, they get a license from the State Department, and then they sell the weapons to the foreign government. Yeah. There. This one. Yeah. Yeah. I knew where I was looking. Now, this one is not just the fireworks. This is also includes helicopters. The big ticket items are helicopters. Right? So this huge peak here is a whole bunch of Blackhawk helicopters. Uh, uh, but they also, you know, someone who's exporting helicopters also has to get a license from the State Department. Uh, and then they're selling to the foreign government. They're typically not selling, in the case of Mexico, they're not selling to a private party. Uh, because only the Mexican army can buy firearms from the exterior or, or heavier equipment as well. Um, so it's, you, you can have, there's some types of sales that are supported by the U.S. government called foreign military sales. Um, that where the U.S. government is more involved. They might be doing training, they might be giving a discount, they might be doing other things that are supporting them. Um, and, uh, but most of these are, are called direct commercial sales where it's really the company getting a license from the U.S. government and then so. Uh, before we take the next question, I just want to mention um, that those of you who, I have a mailing list in the back, and I hope folks will sign up. I don't abuse it. I only send things out every few weeks. And uh, uh, it would be great to stay in touch about these issues. Uh, once in a while. We sent it all the way around oh, while okay. you were talking. Okay. <laughs> so I have a Over question, there. but before I send, I wanted to let you know, just an update. We did pass some legislation that was passed by the Our governor went out the year after that and told the sheriffs that he was sorry he passed and signed that because uh, it, it, some of his staff was um, He's now he's now running for another office and, and saying he's for the assault weapons ban. So I, you know, you never know what, but but um, but what we have is a problem, and I think that also when he did that, gave them license to do this. The sheriffs are not enforcing it, and the um, and the gun stores are selling kits and selling and, and outright selling them. Kits for high capacity magazines. Yeah, they, what they do, I observe this in person. You, they go. The customer goes to the cashier, and the cashier with a 25 round magazine, and the cashier says, "I have to take the spring out of this because it's 25 rounds." And takes it and then shows you how to assemble it and puts it back in the package and completes the sale. The attorney general has stated this is absolutely illegal, but they're they're still doing it. And actually, what I want to do is that we have gun dealer licensing within the state, so we can have another enforcement agency, not sheriffs, because we have too many complicit sheriffs. And um, and and so, so then we can rip their license away if they do this sort of shenanigans. Um, but that's a down the road. But like, I did, I was very really confused, and you maybe said it, but I didn't understand it. Why did the exports of arms go up during Obama? I mean, it was quite a strike. It was like almost two and a half times that, that the guns went, and firearms, and I guess this is all munitions, went up right. so much. So um, it depends a little bit on the country here. So if we look at Mexico, the um, Mérida Initiative, uh, 
He really gets going in 2007, which is right at the end of the Bush administration. <coughs> and even though the, the Merida Initiative is assistance, there were a lot of gun sales that were associated with it. The, the gun sales go up at the time of the Merida Initiative, and they stay up. Um, that's my analysis. Uh, I mean, there might be, have been other calculations on the part of exporters or on the part of the administration. Uh, you know, if you can go to the next slide. Um, in yeah. the case of Honduras, uh, you know, 2009, you have the coup. And there's a kind of a bump, right? And like, okay, we're not going to, I mean, there's some sales in 2009. It doesn't really go up. But then, at a certain point, the U.S. government says, oh, no, you know, the coup, that was a long time ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, they, they normalize relations with the Honduran government in many respects. And, uh, but uh, I could not tell you exactly why it goes way up in 2015. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, that's Guatemala. Yeah. Um, there's also, um, in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, their markets are a little bit different because in, uh, in Honduras and Guatemala, it's run, the, the domestic gun market is run by a, a semi-state entity, which is highly connected to the military. Um, so you have a centralization of their acquisition of guns. Honduras is a huge problem. I mean, until recently, it was legal to own 10 guns for a single person. And just the, the level of, um, of gun violence and corruption in Honduras is, I mean, in all three countries, is, is very serious. You can only carry guns, can't you? You can only carry guns. You can, yeah, you could. That's true. But you also don't live in a society that has the highest gun homicide rate in the world. Um, I, I believe you said that when a firearm or weapon is, is recovered in Mexico or Sent back to the ATF. Was that correct? The information is sent back. Oh, not the gun. The gun itself is not sent back. The gun is is evidence in a crime, so it is actually held either by the military or by the judicial investigators. Yeah. So yeah, but the information is sent to the ATF. And then ATF, they they have a a, a site in Virginia where they do the tracing, and they are also not allowed to digitize the information about firearm sales and serial numbers. So they, they, you know, they have an enormous paper warehouse where they, they have to go through when they get a tracing request in order to figure out where they're working. So, they, I mean, the gun industry has had a very serious impact on these policies. The industry was behind the... The TR amendment, for well, sure. But was it also behind the limitation that this allowed them to be able Do you know to if it's the TR amendment that forbids ATF from digitizing the information? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the TR amendment or something else. Well, um, thank you so much. I don't know if there's more that people want to know. I just want to thank John. I think these are, and then we have a couple announcements. Um, and I think these these issues are really important. Often, uh, I think the issue of gun violence is obviously something we know about here in Colorado, but it's important that we think about it, that the sale of guns don't just impact our own communities where they're being exported um, to the South. And we know that as those of us that work on immigrant rights and here in the news, we have so many people that are coming because of forced migration, because of not being able to live safely in their home countries, and also people that have been here for many, many years who have threat of deportation because we haven't had any reform um, are now uh, also, they cannot go back to the, their country of origins because of this violence. So I am hopeful that we can uh, keep, and, and I think the issue of racism uh, that is very central to all of this, right? Um, that this issue of and so that we think about that in terms of both the policy and the sales of guns and how that plays out in lives and how people are treated and, and who gets in and who gets out kind of things. Um, so, yeah. um, especially for people who are working for migrant justice, so often the focus is on what's happening here, what's happening at the border, and 
maybe what's happening in Central America, but you know, the level of violence in Mexico not only makes it unsustainable for migrants to stay there, but for so many of those communities, and they have a right to stay. You know, they have a, and they want, most people want to stay in their communities. And I think often that part of the picture is absent from a lot of work for migrant justice, and it's just, it's, it's key to understanding.